understand shadow traveling. Okay, everyone, so we're talking about Nico D'Angelo today, if you haven't figured that one out yet. Shadow traveling. Nico, he does a lot of it, okay? And now we're going to talk about him. So, Nico, I'm so excited to hear that he had a point of view because, like I said, in predictions, ever since kind of the House of Hades, when it was like, there is a potential of him having a point of view, I never considered it before. Now we actually have it. I don't know if Rick Riordan was just like, you know, everyone was kind of expecting one for the House of Hades. So I'll put it in the Blood of Olympus, but it actually works out really well, and I, I was really hoping he would, because it's like he's taking back the statue. That sounds pretty important, and you can't blow over that. So, now we have this one, and of course, we start off with Reyna first, so we get Reyna's side of this whole thing first, and you see that he immediately passed out when they, were in, when they arrived in Pompeii, and somebody explain this to me. Somebody. Like I said, I don't understand shadow traveling. Why? Because in the fifth book, Nico explains it as a doorway or a road. What doorway or road leads to the sky? I know, I know there was like two times where he was pulled off course, but still, the sky. There, he shadow traveled at least three times, and all three times they fell. How? Shouldn't it just be like, Here's the ground, and go through a shadow, and then come out on the ground again. What part of go through the shadow and come out up there makes any sense? It makes none. So I don't know how we got up there. Two times I was like, okay, fine. You were pulled off course. Somehow the Hunters of Artemis did this. I don't know, maybe they can do a form of shadow traveling, but they somehow pulled him off course, and a rock mountain god person pulled him off course, so, okay, fine. But, the second time, when they came to that pavilion, no. Anyway, besides that, <laughs> besides that, so, Reyna is really kind of, like, looking, looking at him, and he, she's like, he's so angelic, and that kind of really just gets you, because you're just like, oh, he's had so many problems, such a terrible life, especially in this book series, like, everyone has issues in this series, everyone, and then you get Nico over here, who just has everything wrapped into one, everything, which just makes you, make me want to hug him all the more, and, but, the shadow traveling gets me. And when, so Reyna is kind of more admiring him, I think, because she's starting to realize how much effort he's willing to put into something if it has to be done, especially if it has to be done, because she's lending him her strength in order for him to get them there. And she's probably amazed that he's still going at, by the end. And kind of on Will's side with the whole no shadowy stuff. No underworldy business, because underworldy is a word now. Anyway, that's like the first time we see Nico again, okay? He nearly falls into a volcano, has to get them out, and then falls asleep. Now second time, he falls asleep again! Yay! He does a lot of sleeping in this book. A lot of sleeping. And when he first sleeps, he dream walks, I'm gonna say. Which... Like I said when I reviewed Anubis, he actually explains how that works and why him and Nico are able to do this. So, and what he says in the Red Pyramid is that dreaming is a form of spirit travel, which kind of makes sense because you can never really wake up a demigod when they're seeing their enemies. It's like really, really hard or it takes forever. And you also have, like, I think you also and then you also have a Nico who is just dead to the world. That wasn't meant to be a pun, but he he is pretty much. I mean, you have Coach Hedge, like, tap dancing around his head, and he's still just out. He, he's gone, okay? And that's because he's 
doing his dream thing, as explained by Anubis. So, I'm going to add that to the list of similarities between Nico and Anubis. They need to cross already. Besides that, he goes into his dream, and it seems like that he actually does have a friend, like Cal Clarvis, I think that's how you say it, is, like, from the sleep god's cap cabin, like, he dreams and sleep and stuff. Like, it seems like that they've met before, because Clarvis is just like, huh? Oh, hey, how's it going? What you doing here? And then you get to, then you get to see what's going on through him, and then he wakes up. And now, we get it on to when he talks to Hades. I can't tell you how much I love that scene when he went and talked to Hades. He has to like follow the weird ghosts. He's following them. And again, with the underworldy being a word. And he's following him and then he gets there. And I've seen pictures of this place that he has, that he mentioned that they were in. I've seen like the whole using bones to make everything and decorate everything. And it's kind of creepy. But then again, it's Nico D'Angelo we're talking about. He's still that creepy kid. He's still the creepy one. And his dad comes in and they have this conversation. And I cannot believe I'm going to say this. But Hades. Hades. The Lord of the Dead. For Greek mythology. Nearly made me cry. I say nearly. Because then automatically I was worried that they were going to get there. And then I had to like worry about all this other stuff. But he nearly made me cry. I I can't, I can't believe I just said that, but the Lord of the Dead made me cry in this book. It was so... He did. He he completely did. When they're talking, and it, it starts off like kind of... Like they're just joking with each other, and... Like, that's fantastic, because not very many demigods have a good relationship with their parents. Or at least on the godly side. And at least Nico has like a semi-good relationship with Hades, which is... Pretty good, okay? It sounds, it, it seems, it's really good that that is, and Nico is kind of going over everything. I love that we got to see the last Olympia thing, when Hades is just like, I've never been so harassed by any of my own sons. It was Percy this and Percy that. I was just like, this was my reaction. <laughs> he knows! He knows! Nico was like, no, no, it was just, it was to save the world. He's like, mm-hmm. Sure it was. Sure. After he talks to Hades, the part that made me like cry, like nearly come to tears, is that Hades told Nico, he's like, my kids, they don't get happy endings, but I want you to be the exception. And I was like, dude, after telling him you're probably gonna die on this trip, and then saying that you want him to be an exception, and you want him to be happy, and that he's probably going to end up in the underworld because he's trying to do this thing, and that you're going to be ready for him when he gets there. It's like this. I'm going to cry just thinking about it. Like, I was legitimately going, Nico, Nico! I was, I was legitimately freaking out for Nico because of that part. And then he goes back there, and they're, they're so dumb. It's like, you have Hades saying, look, you're being hunted. You might want to get going. And then you wait. Just wait. I mean, sure, you got to wait for a good shadow to appear, but still. Still, you just wait. Why would you just wait? It's already, like, sunset over in America. Come on. Don't just wait. I think they were in Portugal at this point, too. So, are you kidding? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, they have that fight. That, I love that fight because it's just so cool. And then you get to see, like, you get the idea, like, why do they want the blood of Olympus? The blood. And Nico's blood is the blood of Olympus. I like how the giant explains that different blood does different things. So it seems like that's why they specifically needed a boy and a girl to raise Gaia, their blood. And, like, different blood does different things. How the giant was like, oh, no, your blood couldn't raise Gaia, because it's past dead, but it can destroy things, which actually explains the whole grass just dead when he gets nervous or mad or really any emotion. I mean, the misery goddess, the misery goddess told him straight up, I can't do anything more to you. You're perfect. You're already miserable beyond anything I can do. I can't do anything else to you to make you more miserable. That is... My friends, is when we know that Nico is miserable.
we saw Percy and Anne Beth down there. We thought they were miserable and Tartarus and stuff, but the misery goddess still tried to, like, cause them more misery. Nico, she was like, I can't do anything to you. I, I can't do anything to make you more miserable. Now I really want Rick Riordan to just make, like, Nico's journey through Tartarus, like a short story maybe, but... Okay, that part I was like, dude, you have problems, so many problems. And then the Hunters of Artemis come, and I think he did kind of resent them a little bit. But, but after that, now let's talk about the part where Nico gets a new power. Okay, so after that whole fight, Raina has her moment there where she fights with her sister, and it's all awesome. And he's do trying to get the statue and get ready to shadow travel, and okay, anyway. That part was awesome, too. I can't tell you. All these fight scenes with, like, Oron, I think that's how you say the hunter's name, like, all those fight scenes were just amazing. Like, every fight scene was beautiful and awesome. And now we're talking about the part where Nico gets a new power. Like I said before, Nico D'Angelo always has to get a new power every book. What's his power this time? Well, it's the one I said I wouldn't be surprised if he could do in the last review for him. And that is kill someone just by talking because oh when that guy came one Nico is not psycho yes Nico is not psycho like everyone like uh, I don't know why everyone thinks that he probably will go psycho probably because he's the son of a death god but still he's not psycho the other guy though yeah that's psycho he the other kid's psycho he's psycho number two if you remember from Octavian's review Psy Octavian is is psycho number one and he is psycho number two so he's psycho number two and oh when he came there and he was taunting me you know, all the dead are being raised and it's like this power struggle between the two of them because he's like if you try anything you are just going to turn into a puddle of shadows you'll disappear into the shadows and never return now, i don't understand that but we actually found his limit so we know his limit now but Still hearing that from him, that made me nervous. I was like, why? I, I don't know why, I guess that's his limit. So that makes me wonder if Percy like uses his water powers too much. Does he turn into water? Does Jason turn into air? Could Leo turn into fire for like permanently? Yeah, okay, that just freaks me out just thinking of all of the other characters. Like, could they actually like get as far as Nico got with his powers? But I, I don't know, they don't try, so Let's keep it that. Let's keep it that way. Nico could be like, don't try. Don't try. It'll turn you to shadows. So, that's good. And, like, apparently it takes him so long to get his powers back, I guess, because even at the end, it was like, you couldn't summon a wishbone without turning into a puddle of shadows right now. And it's like, again, don't really understand this, but don't try it. Please don't. Back to the point with that guy. Oh, that guy. When he was like... What are your secrets? Cause Bryce, I think his name is. So Bryce's dad is like, no, you can't break an oath. You can't break an oath. And that's his thing. Like, all these people who broke an oath, th those are the dead that he can control. Okay? But you have Nico, and Nico can control just the dead in general. So I think he can control it more, but like I said, Nico's really weak. But, oh, when Bryce, like, mentioned the secrets... I could not tell you. I was staring at it going like, I'm pretty sure what's going through Nico's head right now is game on. Because that is what happened. He just let loose his secrets. And I really think that was one of the turning points for Nico, like a big turning point for him when he just let loose his secrets and was like, you know what? Fine. No, I'm not going to keep my secrets anymore. You want to know them? Sure. You're going to die anyway. And he did because Nico was just like you're already dead the guys like no I'm not and he's just like really and suddenly he started turning into a ghost and he was like be gone and then the, just vanished and I was like Nico that just was beyond amazing and anything I thought he could ever do like I remember being amazed back when he summoned a giant thing of rocks to stop Cronus. I remember being amazed when he came with an army of the dead. I remember being amazed when he was like, I went through Tartarus by myself. I remember being amazed for all these parts. But none of them compared to that part from 
this book, except for one, but we'll get there in a second, because now let's go to the ending fight. I always have to bring up the ending fight. You guys know how much I love that ending fight scene. You have the seven off, they're fighting the giants, they're being awesome. Like I said with Jason, it's like the panning, you're turning. That's the one thing I want to see happen in a movie, yet they'll still find a way to mess up this awesome scene. Not talking about movies, though. And... And then we had Reyna and Nico trying to get the statue back. Okay, so we had, like, them, they were on the boat, and I don't know. Apparently, Nico can send dreams now. Apparently, he can send dreams now. I don't get it. Again, really don't get how this whole, like, dreams and death it just makes you nervous to go to sleep. It really does, because you're like... He can control dreams, and he's linked with death. Does that mean dreams are linked with death? Questions. But then the Centurions, I think, they help, they get down there, and then they help him out, and they, I like that we, they also kind of had, like, another perspective, where it quickly was kind of like Nico's, and when, like, he remembered them, they kind of weren't, like, ever really afraid of him, but <laughs> seeing him raise a zombie was pretty awesome. Yeah, Alfred, you know, the French zombie chauffeur, which is really interesting. I was just like, say what? A what? French zombie chauffeur. Huh? I was really, the, that one just came out of nowhere. It makes sense for some parts, because it's like, that actually explains how Nico traveled a lot. Then again, you kind of, I kind of always just assumed he shadow traveled, but whatever. It does explain how he traveled a lot, and that was so, it was just so funny how he come, zombie comes up, they all go, he goes to the car, Nico, shotgun, and there he goes, and it's just, the other two are standing there, okay, alright, and, you know, they go through the monsters, they get there, and then, oh, Will, Will, you might be like, why are you mad at Will, let me tell you why I'm mad at Will, let me tell you, because, he couldn't have just let Nico finish his sentence. I really, really wanted to see Octavian find out that Nico was Greek. I really wanted to see that. I know he'd probably find out in death, because Nico could go down there and be like, by the way, I'm Greek. Just to tell him, but... Like, Nico's going on about this, and he's just like, because I'm the son of Will cuts him off. And it's just like, one more word. You couldn't have just let him finish the word? really but at the same time it was so sweet because will was like hold up hold up hold on hold everything stopping the end of the world here nico we are talking about this now no no not later now i don't care about the end of the world we're talking about this now and that was just so sweet it's like oh he's stopping the end of the world to talk to you that's so sweet we'll talk about nico's love life in a minute first let's get through the awesome fighting stuff so now, after the whole Will stops seeing the world thing, Octavian gets them back on track, oddly enough, and is like, okay, end of the world, people. All the monsters are, like, rebelling and reattacking, and then Gaia's, like, sucking them into the ground, and there's the fight going on up there, and all the seven just came, and it's all so awesome. And, and then Nico goes over to fight Octavian, because in the midst of all this fight, he slips away to the catapults. Now... I, I was with Nico. I was like, please kill him. Nico was like, I could kill you right now. And I'm like, do it. But he did it. And then it comes it comes to a full circle because everything in Rick Riordan's books has to come back around. When Hades was talking to Nico at the beginning, Hades was like, some deaths cannot be prevented. And I was like, oh, one of the seven's going to die. One of the seven, which they did. But they came back to life. But the death he was talking about was Octavius, and Nico was kind of just like, dude, you, you're close. Fine, go for it. We obviously cannot stop you. You have got to launch the catapults, I guess. And he does, and it's like... Nico's like, eh. Except then he's like, oh, I really hope Will doesn't think I'm a monster now. And it's just like... Octavian was the monster. Not you. Not you. No, no, not even close. And, we, and then the ending comes and everything's happy and good and he's just like, I'm sorry guys, Leo is dead. Which is the sad part. And now we talk about Nico's love life. Now let's talk. So during the course of this book, you have Crush on Percy at the beginning. 
okay when he was thinking he thought about him except then I think he started to develop a crush on Jason a little bit just just a teeny bit maybe that was because Jason kind of knew his secret was accepting him so maybe there was a small crush there just for a little bit but then Will comes in and just knocks everyone down I would have never ever guessed I gotta go back and read this because I remember Will occasionally appearing in there and I'm just like like really except then I was like well you know never saw that much of Will in the la other series but Will, uh, Will just to give him a little part for a second he did an awesome job I can't tell you that how cool the whistle thing was and again and again just going stop the end of the world Nico we're talking right now and Okay, that ending scene, Will, Percy, Nico, and Annabeth. Okay, so Percy and Annabeth are over there. Nico, like, and Will go up to each other because Will is like, you, here, now. Pretty much. That's, that's kind of what he did without saying it. So it looked it look like... And Nico comes over and he's just like, where have you been? You don't think I want to see your face around here? Oh, you're, you are so dead. I love that he, he kept repeating, you're so dense, you're so dense, you're so dense, and you got the idea, like, oh, you like him, and he likes you, because he says, like, little skeleton butterflies are resurrecting in his stomach, and it's like, oh, it's creepy, but it's so adorable, and you get the idea that, uh, that they're gonna go out, I give him a week tops to start dating, to start dating, and oh, I cannot tell you how much I love the scene where he was just, love the ending part with Percy, he was just like, yeah, I had a crush on you, but now I don't. Okay. Like, I can't tell you how deep and amazing that thing was, because you go from him not even wanting to talk about it to him just out front saying it to Percy. I guess that's what he meant, because he did mention earlier where he was like, he hated Cupid, not for making him tell everyone, but for making him tell everyone. See, he would have eventually come out with it in his own way, but he hated that Cupid forced it on him and said, you have to tell. Right now. So, so I don't really know how he would have done it, when he would have done it, but that seemed like a pretty good time to do it. Which is just amazing, and I love that scene so much. And speaking of that scene, oh, it, Nico's part is so short today because it is literally just this one scene, and I've read it so many times, I practically have it memorized, but I'm still going to open the book to be sure I get it word for word. Word for word, you got it? So, Nico said, since we're going to be spending at least a year seeing each other at camp, I think I should clear the air. Percy smiled, wavered. What do you mean? For a long time, Nico said, I had a crush on you. I just wanted you to know. Percy looked at Nico, then at Annabeth, as if to check he heard correctly, then back at Nico. You, yeah, Nico said. You're a great person, but I'm over that. I'm happy for you guys. You, you mean, right. Annabeth's gray eyes started to sparkle. She gave Nico a sideways smile. Wait, Percy said. So you mean, right, Nico said again. But it's cool. We're cool. I mean, I seen how you're cute, but you're not my type. I'm not your type. Wait, so, see you around, Percy, Nico said. Annabeth? She raised her hand for a high five. Nico obliged and walked back across the green where Will Solstice was waiting. Solangelo. Right there, Solangelo. That, that's their ship name, Solangelo. That's their ship name, Solangelo. It's their last name. I don't know why. You can't really do much with their first names. Each four letters, so like Wilco or Nil. I don't know. Which one do you like better? I don't know. Solangelo is their ship name, okay? People have already officially named that, and I love it so much, that line where he's just like, you're cute, but you're not my type. The best line, that was the best line of the whole book! Honestly, honestly best line of the whole book. A close second was Percy's, but we'll talk about Percy later. And I read that part like 20 times before I actually finished the book. Because I was like, <laughs> I got it. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Wait, no, I got it. <laughs> I, I got ahead. I had to read that a couple times, and that is Nico D'Angelo for you. Now, before we go to the Rick Riordan tweet of the day, I would like to add a new segment. This segment is for only Nico, Percy, and Annabeth. Why? Because they are the characters we have known the longest. 
and as you have may, you may or may not have heard, I am going backwards from the characters that we have known the shortest to the longest. So it is going to go Nico, Annabeth, Percy. So next week is going to be Annabeth if you're keeping up with this. But Nico D'Angelo. Let's just look back, shall we? So I have the Titan's Curse here, and we go to the Blood of Olympus. So much difference between them, because Nico started off as this talkative, energetic kid, and then after like all of these events, we get to this Nico, who is confident, and is very is very powerful, is very I don't care what you think of me now, and he is happy. That is the main thing. It's come all the way around. Nico was just a happy, energetic kid here, and now. He finally, and I say finally, like, with so much emphasis, finally is happy in the blood of Olympus. And now, for the Rick Riordan sweet of the day. This one seems to fit the theme of death, so let's see. Someone asked, Percy could, if he wanted, kill any mortal simply boiling your blood. Rick Riordan's response. What a cheerful thought. No, no he couldn't. Well, well, there goes one very fun violent power, but we already got a fun violent one with Nico where he can just tell people to die. Again, don't, don't understand this whole you're already dead thing, but yeah. So that's Nico D'Angelo for you. Next week we will be talking about Annabeth Chase. But that's it for this time. Thanks for watching. Bye!